there are many causes of it, but mainly it's the environmental factors in a genetically predisposed child where type 1 diabetes occurs. So in the genetic predisposition, uh, predisposition, you'll find that these children, most of them have HLA class 2 genes, that is the DR3 and DR4. Surprisingly, you'll find that 70 to 80 percent of newly diagnosed children, they don't have any family history. But genetic predisposition also proved by one thing that you'll, uh, it has been seen in literature that if the mother suffers from diabetes, two to three percent of the offsprings will have chances are of the offsprings having diabetes. If the father has diabetes, there are 6% chances of the offspring having diabetes. But if both parents have diabetes, then the 30% chances of the uh, offspring having a diabetes. Another thing has been noticed in twins. Monozygotic twins have got a 60% concordance. That, that means if one twin has diabetes, there are 60% chances, chances that the other twin also has diabetes. While in dizygotic twins, the incidence is all less about 10 to 12%. So the definite genetic predisposition is there. Then the environmental factors play a big role. One of the main factors which has been recognized may be viral infections. So in viral infections, it's been seen that congenital rubella, mumps and enteroviruses play, play a big role. And uh, as we all know that one of the complications of mumps is pancreatitis. So maybe pancreatitis due to mumps may lead to destruction of the production of the autoimmune antibodies and destruction of the pancreas. But some people disprove this theory. They say now that the mumps vaccine has been given universally, still the children are getting type 1 diabetes. So it may or may not be related to mumps. So still not very sure. Uh, it's been postulated. or In fact, there's a hypothesis which is called a microbial deprivation hypothesis meaning that in Western countries, in countries, advanced countries, where the infection rate is generally going down, there the type 1 diabetes rate is going high because the infections are controlled and now the autoimmune disorders and the other disorders like lifestyle diseases, they are becoming more and more common. In fact, a study was carried out in two countries. The, there's one state in Russia, which is adjacent to Finland. So Finland, and uh, there is a high incidence of type 1 diabetes in uh, Finland as compared to that state in Russia. So the investigators, they found that in Russia, these children have high levels of IgE anti uh, antibodies, which are due to parasitic inf infestations. So probably this parasitic infestation, the children in Russia, they lead, the incidence of type 1 diabetes is low there. While in Finland, because people in that state of Russia and in Finland, they are quite genetically similar. And their lifestyle is also the same, except for this infestation of parasites, which is more in Russia. They found that type 1 diabetes incidence in children is more in Finland as compared to that state in Russia. So still, uh, we still not very sure about this, whether this is true or not, but some people have postulated this hypothesis. Then diet especially if a baby is breastfed, exclusive breastfeeding till six months of age and continuing till about one to two years, it does give protection against type 1 diabetes. Stress, stress is a very major factor. We think that children, they, are, they, are, they don't get any stress. Well, you'd be surprised to see that many children become very stressful, especially looking at the, if their family environment is not good, if uh, the, both the parents are not getting along well, they're fighting with each other, children are become also become stressful. Ionizing radiation is another cause where there may be production of autoimmune antibodies or destruction of the pancreas directly. Very rarely, there might be, might be an iatrogenic cause where the pan, part of the pancreas has been removed due to surgery, due to, maybe due to any cause. So these are the main etiological factors giving rise to type 1 diabetes. Just a word about type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is due to insulin resistance. Usually these children are older, they're obese, and there's a positive family history seen. Very commonly you'll find acanthosis nigricans, which is, you can see freckles, which are seen, are dark freckles, which are seen at the nape of the neck, at the axillary region of these children. These prove that child has got type two diabetes. Fortunately, they are not prone to ketosis. 
but initial resistance of insulin to the adipose tissue to the skeletal muscle is later on it is followed by beta cell failure so initially you'll find that they may may not require insulin but ultimately all these children also require insulin so type 1 diabetes has got four distinct stages that is the natural history which has been observed in these patients so firstly it's a pre clinical beta cell autoimmunity autoimmune bodies are produced so these children if tested before they present with diabetes autoimmune antibodies have been found in these children and later on there's a defect in insulin secretion when the gradually the beta cells are destroyed then the clinical diabetes comes in the features of polyuria polydipsy polydipsia polyphagia classical symptoms are seen in these children followed by once you start the treatment there may be remission for a very short period this remission also known as the honeymoon period this may occur because all the beta cell uh, are not destroyed at the same time some of them may still be producing insulin but gradually as they are destroyed then established uh, diabetes is established later on if not controlled properly if hyperglycemia is not controlled it can be to acute or chronic complication and decrease life expectancy in children the diabetes is manifested any time between 5 to 15 years of age but mainly two peaks are seen first peak at the age of 5 to 7 years again this has been thought probably because this is the age when the child starts going to school starts getting infections so maybe that's why this first peak is seen at the age of 5 to 7 years second peak is seen at puberty when this pubertal growth spurt occurs here you'll find in the pubertal growth spurt occurs many hormones are released and there's an increased level of growth hormones increased level of steroids probably that may be resulting in type 1 diabetes that's one of the postulated theories now the classical features of diabetes type 1 diabetes are polyuria that the child because type of hyperglycemia there is osmotic diuresis so there's polyuria because of polyuria the child wants to drink more and more water to make up for it for the lost uh, loss of fluids in the urine and now because insulin is not there the metabolism is affected so the cells are not receiving adequate nutrition so the compensatory mechanism occurs that the child tries to the body uh, creates hunger pangs in the child child wants to eat more and more but in spite of eating eating more the child has weight loss because insulin is not metabolizing the food and the food is not being consumed by the cells so the weight loss occurs the cells cannot grow the cells cannot increase in size increase in number so there is weight loss which occurs in these children child who was earlier dry at night develops nocturnal enuresis along with this because again the calories are not being produced because of insulin absence or decrease in insulin the child is always fatigued suffers from weakness and malaise there is decrease in the immunity also so there these children are more prone to getting skin and other infections especially urinary tract infections are very common in these children so diagnosis is established once the child comes with these uh, symptoms always do a blood glucose and the blood glucose random blood glucose more than 140 mg per deciliter or 11.1 millimoles per liter with or without glycosuria and ketone urea establishes the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes or a fasting blood glucose taken an early morning sample or a fasting sample it will be more than 7 millimoles per liter or 126 mg per deciliter or there may be a raised glycosylated hemoglobin that is hba1c of more than 6.5% any of these factors present a random glucose of more than 140 a fasting blood glucose of more than 126 and a glycosylated hemoglobin of more than 6.5% give a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes or give a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus oral glucose tolerance test is rarely required in these children you don't need to do a oral gtt in these children so what will be the management i have not talked about other investigations which should be done but and just because to establish the diagnosis will otherwise you should do a, a renal function test serum electrolytes and the blood for 
culture, also do a urine culture to see there's no infection, do an X-ray of the chest to see there's no infection in the lungs. So all these should be done at the first visit to form a baseline. Uh, then for management, one thing we must bear in mind, management in children is slightly more difficult as compared to adults. Firstly, because of the problem that giving injection every time to the child, it's painful. Though now we have better methods of giving uh, injection of insulin where the thinner needles are there, but still the child resents that. Also, you cannot control the diet very easily in these children because diet is a prime importance in managing diabetes. So child becomes at times very moody. Sometimes the child, and even normal children you'll find, you know, sometimes they'll take food to their liking, if it's to their liking, otherwise they may not accept food at all. If it's not to their liking, they will go out and play, they may not go out and play. So the activity varies, the diet varies. So it becomes slightly difficult in children to control diabetes. But it's very important on the part of the doctors and the healthcare worker that we should try and establish an excellent diabetic control. And this involves many goals. Firstly, we must try and maintain the blood glucose levels and the HbA1c levels close to normal without causing hypoglycemia. Because hypoglycemia is very common occurrence in these children who are given insulin. Once we establish good blood glucose levels, then automatically you'll find that polyuria and octuria eliminated, ketoacidosis can be prevented. And we have to see that these children grow normally. Because this is a time when children are growing, their growth and development should not be affected. Very important part. Also, it uh, should be our endeavor that we avoid any diabetes related complications. So the pillar of management is the insulin therapy. These children will require exogenous insulin throughout life. It's not that you feel that after a few years, oh, we give insulin for a few years and we'll find after a few years, the children will not require insulin. No, they'll require insulin throughout life. This has to be brought to the notice of the parents. They have to be made to understand, well, this child will require insulin therapy. That's the main pillar of management on which whole the management of the uh, problem rests. Other pillars are blood glucose monitoring, a frequent blood glucose monitoring is essential if we have to achieve good hypoglycemia or good uh, the glycemic control. Along with that is the diet, also plays a very important role. Exercise and not to forget counseling and education of the child as well as parents. We must tell the parents when to give their insulin, how much insulin to be given, teach them how to give the insulin injection. Child is old enough to learn. We can also teach the child to inject himself or herself. Also tell the parents on what diet the child should have. A dietitian should be consulted along with the doctor, the dietitian and the parents and the child all should sit together and discuss what diet the child should have, what is good for the child, what is not good for the child. You see, the children are very fond of chocolates, sweets, cakes and all. Unfortunately, all these are totally prohibited in these children. But maybe at times, once in, once in two weeks or so, a little cheat day where small amount of cake or ice cream can be taken, but as far as possible, avoid, totally avoid. So it's very important that we educate the parents accordingly. 